Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians as we're doing our verse-by-verse study. And we're in chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. While you're turning there, today is one year in this building as New Life Church. So a year ago, and I, Tina and I were talking about this, talking about a fast year. I was like, already a year? I mean, it has flown by, but this is our, our one year in, in this building, and, and it's just amazing all the lives that we've seen changed and, and just excitement of what God has been doing and, and will continue to do uh, through uh, this ministry, and, and I'm just excited about it. And, and just, you know, we've had... all. This month is always a bunch of anniversaries for North Augusta campus. You know, we started on March 5th uh, in 2017, and we celebrated that a few weeks ago. Tina and I weren't there, but y'all celebrated and, and all that. And then we celebrated being able to get the facilities across the street, and then we get to come over here. And so it's just exciting all that God's doing in, in the life of, of not just New Life, but specifically for us here at North Augusta. All right, so you're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and this is kind of an unusual, kind of an unusual message, because when, you, when, you're, when you're going by, verse by verse, you just kind of take what comes, you know, and, and, and you preach it, you know, and, and you get with the Holy Spirit, and you find out, okay, what is, what is the point here? What, what do you want to speak to me to speak to uh, those that will be present this morning and those that will be watching online about what you're wanting to do? And, and as we started this book uh, uh, several, several weeks ago, and, and we begin to get the concept, and usually at the end of every chapter, he deals with the rapture. And, 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 and he talks about our faith, our hope, and our love. Those are three things that you will see from the Apostle Paul. Uh, no matter, not just at, at Thessalonica, but all the churches that he uh, dealt with and he helped start, the thing that, that will drive him is faith, hope, and love. And those three things. And, and, and we, we have said here that, you know, we have uh, been... Uh, active in, in making sure that uh, we have given the message that for, for this campus, yes, we want to be a people of faith. We want to have a hope. But this year specifically, we are driving ourselves in love. We're going to be a loving place. We're going to love each other. And, and it's not like you're not, but I, I love some things he told Thessalonica because they had faith, hope, and love. But then he said, I want you to abound more and more. So about the time you think, I can't love people anymore, you're going to abound, and you're going to love them even more. And, and of course, you know, when you're learning to love people, uh, it, you know, that's relationships. And when you're building relationships, yeah, okay, how many, you know, relationships can be tough sometimes. This is why we have to love. And so, because part of love is endurance, yeah, the long haul. Uh, part of love is patience. Uh, and, and, and by the way, uh, you get your patience by the testing of your faith. That's why we got to have faith, hope, and love. And so the testing of your faith produces patience, which is going to allow you to even be able to put up with me even more and that you can love me even more and I can love you even more and you can love the person sitting next to you uh, even if it is your spouse uh, or you can love the person sitting across the building from you even more and so that's that's our theme this year is love we want you to get to connect with each other get to know each other have life with each other and, and that's so important today as we, as we get closer and closer to that time that the rapture is going to take place. I want to have such a tight relationship with each other in love that, man, when we get up there, it just, I mean, it's just like, wow, we were already experiencing heaven down here. Thank you, Taylor and Mallory. Yeah, you're excited about it. And so the rest of you better get excited about it because if you're a believer, you're going there. So you might as well go ahead and start practicing now. Amen? And, and, and by the way, he says in Corinthians that now abides faith, hope, and love. But then he said this, the greatest of these is love. You know why that is? Because one day you won't need faith. One day you won't need the hope of the blessed hope. 
because you will be experiencing it. But guess what will always be? Love. That's why it's the greatest. And so we're going to get a head start on that. So here today as we're looking at this, and those who have been around my ministry for quite a few years know that I have a, a hunger and a great desire for Paul's epistles. I love the epistles of Paul. And the reason why is because this is, this is Paul writing to the church. I mean, to the church. And, and as we read these scriptures, it, it's, it, it's not, it, it's, it, this is not something that one day in the sweet by and by. This is something that we live today for our everyday doctrine is the thing that he writes in his epistles. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't been a, a, a student of Paul's epistles, just try it. Just try it. So you can start in, in Romans series trying to talk to me here. Hold on, I don't know what I said. Yes, series like most women, they hear what they want to hear. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, as you're running out the door, as got, I got your back, Pastor, but <laughs> I didn't say it. Oh, man, I lost my thought on that one. Good grief. Sometimes, sometimes Tina goes, why would you say that? And I go, I don't know. It just it slips through the coffee filter, and it just slips through there. And you know how you get little grounds in your coffee sometimes? Yeah, how did it go? I had a filter. I had the filter. I don't know how some of this stuff gets through, but it happens sometimes but I, but I love to study these epistles because Paul's epistles are just I want to get grounded more and more in his epistles and you can start studying starting in Romans all the way through Philemon or or, or the ones that that we know that Paul wrote matter of fact Paul wrote a good a good bit of the New Testament I mean he wrote a good bit of it and but the thing I love about Paul is he's just like you and I he's human I mean, I love Jesus. I mean, He's our greatest example. But I can't walk on water. <laughs> I need somebody who, you know, can, and so I have Paul to go, hey, if God saw fit that Paul could write most of the New Testament, and, and as Paul would often say, imitate me as I imitate Christ, I, I think, you know, we're in good company to do that. So, so my title of my message this morning is that the church must learn to study Paul's epistles. Uh, it's a very simple title, but it's a, an important title because I, I, I think, I, listen, I love the Old Testament. Man, I love to hear the stories and see the stories of, 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 of all the things that, that, that was happening at that time, and, and it's awesome. And, and I love Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because Jesus came in His earthly ministry, and, and He did all the things He did. But as I often like to say, because people will say, man, I wish I could have been alive back in the Old Testament. I mean... I wish I could have been alive when Jesus walked on the earth. I wish I could have been alive. Not me. Because we have so much better today. And the reason why, y'all heard me say this, those who have been around a while, I'm just repeating, okay? But I want you to get it in your spirit enough to know this, that when he was with the disciples, if he was on one side of town with Peter, James, and John, he couldn't be on the other side of town with the other guys. You and I... As believers, wherever we go, He is as alive in us as He was when He was here on the earth. Except for the fact that wherever I go, I take Him with me. Wherever you go, you take Him with you. That is far better than what they had. And this is what Paul is now teaching and showing us with these churches that as he established them to get them to see who they are in Christ and their position with him and, and what he's doing today. And I, I said this, I think last week, these are the greatest days of the church. The greatest days. You say, yeah, but all this stuff's going on. That's what makes it the greatest days of the church. You know, when, when, when chaos has happened around the world, we were destined for this time. 
You know, when, when Paul is dealing with what he's dealing with with writing to these churches, Paul wasn't sitting on the couch with everything going great writing letters. No, he was usually just got through getting beat up, thrown rocks at, in prison, just got out of prison, waiting to go to prison, running for his life, and yet his life is about sharing the good news to the churches to get them on fire. Because what Paul did as a single person, can you imagine if the church got a hold of that? And if one man can, can do what he did, can you imagine what the church could do today around the world? But we got to get and understand where we are. And that's why I say study these epistles. And, and so that, that has been my heartbeat uh, to teach. And, and, and I, loved, I, I love to teach Paul's epistles. And, and sometimes, you know, everybody has their little wheelhouse of what they do. And, and, and that's fine. You know, some people's wheelhouse is to teach the Old Testament. And that's great, man. They can open up the Old Testament. They can just take those things of the shadows and the things that show Christ. And they, just, they do that so well. And I go, wow, that is just so cool. But that's just not my wheelhouse. But my wheelhouse is getting into the epistles and breaking them up and teaching them to the body of Christ so that we are strengthened in what we know. And as I like to say, I don't want you to know what you believe. I want you to know why you believe it. Because if you ever get your why, then someone can't come in and corrupt your belief. Because if you don't know why you believe what you believe, then you're going to hear somebody on the radio, or you're going to hear somebody uh, say something, or you're going to watch a podcast, you're going to read a book, you're going to hear a pastor, and you're going to be like, well, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe they're right. Well, but when you know truth, the Bible says it makes you free. And so when you get in there and are made free, and you know why you believe what you believe, then you're not going to be knocked off by every little wind of doctrine that James talks about. Tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And that happens because we don't know why we believe what we believe. If you believe salvation is by grace through faith, you need to know why you believe that. And so what, I'm, what am I going to do? Thus saith the Word. What the Word says gives me my why. And that's what Paul literally does through his epistles, is to give us our why. And so we're not moved from that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and verse 1, Paul says this. He says, uh, I'm on the wrong page. There you go. He says, finally then... He's coming to the end. He's getting close to coming to the end of the first, the first letter of, of Thessalonians. And, and, of course, we're going to continue in and go to the second letter. We're doing all of Thessalonians. Remember, he, he had come. He had, he had established his church. He was only there like three or four weeks. And yet, out of this three or four weeks, his church had been established there. And not long after he wrote it, he had to get out and leave. So he's away from them. Last week, we talked about it. I mean, he, he wanted to be there with them, but he couldn't be there with them uh, it wasn't he was just being hindered or whatever it was. He couldn't be there with them. And so he sent Timothy there to encourage them because he had to know that they were doing okay. Can you imagine having, having someone that you've led to Christ and then they're not in your life the, the next day or the next week? And then you go, I wonder how they're doing. I, I, hope, they're, I hope they're okay. I hope they're still trying to grow. I hope they're still enduring maybe the persecution because we learned last week that persecution will come because we found out last week that we are appointed to affliction. Well, if you weren't here for that one, that was exciting. Uh, you're appointed to affliction, and, and, and that's what we're called. Uh, Christ was afflicted. Paul was under affliction. You and I will be under affliction, but that is good news because if the devil ain't bothering you, it's a good sign you're not a threat. So the devil bothers me because I'm going to be a threat. I'm going to be a threat to him. I want you to be a threat to the devil. And, 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 and so when the affliction comes, you endure affliction as a good soldier, the Bible says. Paul writes about. And so he says, finally then, I'm coming to the end of this letter. He says, brethren, we urge you and exhort in the, as you have received from us how you ought to walk and please God. As he 
comes to this end of this first letter, he says, listen, I exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more and more and more. But he said, I urge you. In other words, when, when someone takes it to the urge, the exhort, they're encouraging, but a urging is a little more than encouragement. That's almost like, you know, kind of like when we get our kids and we're trying to urge them to, to, to do what we need them to do, clean their room, take out the trash. We will, we, will, we will maybe exhort, hey, you need to get that garbage put out. But then there's sometimes we have to urge, you know. And, and, and so he says, you know, listen, we urge you, we urge you, we urge you, and we exhort you, and we want you to, to be exhorted in this. And he says that you should abound more and more. Abound how? More and more. And more. This is what we just said a while ago. This church, I mean, they had a testimony of their faith, their hope, and their love. That, that, that Paul would come out and say that you would be encouraged and urged to abound more and more. So in other words, as long as we're here on this earth, there is no stopping ground. There will be a day when we will get to rest, completely rest. Now, you might, you know, now we need to always be at rest in our spirit, right? Matter of fact, the Old Testament, they had their Sabbath day. Well, today, that was a picture of a person, and that's Jesus. Jesus is our Sabbath. That means every day we should be at rest in Him. But as far as being at rest from what God has called us to do, that's not going to happen while we're here. There will be a rest time, but now's not the time. And so we need to be abounding more and more. And it says, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and please God. And so Paul, as he has done many times in his scripture, he encourages them to follow his example. Now, that's a lot of responsibility. Can you imagine telling everybody you know, hey, you need to do like I do. Now, would we be confident in that to tell everybody, you do what I do? Or would we go, uh, do as I say, (laughs) but not as I do? Because that's sometimes what we, you know, we'll say, you know, do as I say, not as I do. But Paul was saying, do as I say and do as I do. We need to get to that place in our life where we're abounding so much in our faith, our hope, and our love that we can be the example setters as Paul's the example setter. And that so we can we can do as he says they had received from us. And of course he Paul says us because he had those faithful guys that that traveled with him and and you had you had Silas and you had Timothy and Barnabas, you had several of them that traveled with him at times. But but Paul said, You've received to us how you ought to walk and to please God. Now, sometimes it happens when, when someone who's big on grace, and I am extremely big on God's grace, some people take it to an area of grace where saying, well, you have grace, so it doesn't matter how you live. That is an abuse and a false teaching of grace. And, and so... Those of us who that preach grace have to preach it with grace and truth. Because that's what Jesus said that He came in, in, in grace and truth. And, and so the two go together. And, and what I usually always like to say about grace and truth, if, if you have truth and you don't have grace, we can become very legalistic. Ever meet people, they have a lot of truth, but they have no grace, and it's all a bunch of do's and don'ts and cracking and blah, 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 and it's just full of legalism. And and, and that's a wrong. That is is an abuse uh, uh, of taking God's truth. But then you have those that way over here that have all the grace, but they have no truth, and it becomes abuse. And, and, and then that has happened in many times and in many churches. And so we have to make sure that we're putting the two together. So as much as Paul talked about the grace of God, which he does a lot, he made it very clear here that they had received these things of Paul, 
so that they ought to know how to walk and to please God. To walk means how to conduct yourselves. With grace, you always get the position first. You, you, you are given a position in Christ the moment you get saved. Sometimes that position doesn't line up with where we are in our lives yet. But you already had the position. See, under the old covenant, if you did, you got. And if you didn't, you didn't. <laughs> you didn't get. Under the new covenant, you get. You get the, the, the part of if I do enough, if I, no, you get. That's the position. But it always, grace is always motivated by love. And because of your love for the Father, because of the love that He's given us, naturally we will begin to want to walk in our position. Matter of fact, I say if you're a believer, that will be a desire of your heart. For me, it's part of the litmus test for ourselves. Because if I don't have a desire to please the Lord, then maybe I'm not His. Because I believe there will be a desire to please Him. Why? Because of grace. Grace brings in the motivation of love. And so he said, you've received from a... Where's, we are setting the example. And Paul is our example today of an everyday believer, just like you and I, Paul was, and, and he made it a point to make sure that we were following the way he said to do. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 4.16, I've read some of these verses before. He says, therefore I urge you, imitate me. I urge you. There's that word again. Paul's always urging and exhorting. Sometimes we have to make sure that you add the exhortment with the urge. Because if, if someone's just urging all the time and they're not encouraging you, you can feel like, I'm, man, I'm just beat down. I can't. Good grief. How can I do this? But at the same time, Paul's like, well, you can do this because your life is here with Christ and God. You can do this because He has taken everything and He's given you all that you, that you need. And so I urge you, get this done, but at the same time, I encourage you. I encourage you. And here he says, I urge you, imitate me. And so Paul was very clear. Follow me. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, again, imitate me, and then he put this in, just as I also imitate Christ. Paul made that clear. Because why? Because Paul's human. <laughs> See, that's, whoa, we're on the ground with Paul. Okay, all right. If, if, you know, and, and we can say that. Follow me as I follow Christ. And, and, and some of y'all have heard me say this before. My, my greatest example of that it was back in the 90s when I went to Atlanta and I got to drive the Atlanta Motor Speedway. I had gotten a few um, violations of going too fast on the road and had gotten a few tickets. And the church that I was at for pastor appreciation thought we need to help the pastor out so he can get this out of his system. And so they sent me to the Atlanta Motor Speedway that I got to drive on that track. What they did was messed up because they, they set a fire in me. Now it's hard to drive slow now because, I mean, I experienced what real speed is and it backfired. But I remember going to that and I was so excited. I was going to drive that car. Man, I was so excited. You know, it, it was like, you know, I feel like Dukes of Hazard because I went through the window to get in the car, you know. They didn't open the door, you know. And, and, and I slipped in there. And, man, I, I, I thought, man, this is going to be awesome. And I remember that we had to go through the class before. You know, they just don't put you out on the track, you know. We had to go through this two- or three-hour class before we even got to the riding. And I remember the, the car driver saying this. Now, you're going to have a spotter in front of you. Always follow the spotter unless he turns right. If you know anything about car racing, if you turn right, you're going into the wall. So they said, follow me unless I go right. Well, for Paul, he says, 
follow me as long as I'm following Christ. In other words, if I'm not following Christ, then do not follow me. And that may be the way we need to tell people, listen, I want you to follow me unless I'm not following Christ. You know, and then don't follow me. Uh, follow me unless you're riding behind me on the interstate with people in the left lane that should be in the right lane. Uh, and then don't follow me as I follow Christ because, you know, I am getting better though. I am. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm not what I need to be, but praise God, I am not what I was. But he says, imitate me, Paul said. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so Paul knew the responsibility. And, and, and remember, Paul's like you and I. So all of us, not just the pastors, but you have a responsibility because I'm going to tell you this. Somebody is looking to you. Somebody. It could be a family member. It could be a coworker, could be a neighbor. Because, I mean, I'm sure we've told them that we're, we're Christians, you know. It, we're Christian. You know, the, the word Christian was given to Christians not by Christians. The word Christians was given to Christians by unbelievers because they said, you are Christ followers. And so that's how we got the word Christian. So, if you have in any way shown a light, your neighbors, your family, your friends, your co-workers, know that you are a Christian. That means you are a Christ follower. And so we have a responsibility to make sure that we're doing, as he said uh, up there, that we're hearing from Paul how we ought to walk and please God because somebody's watching us. And I I want to do everything I can not to take someone down a wrong road. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I, I, it may happen, but it's not going to be because I'm not being alert about it. I, I need to know that someone's watching my life. And then God put this beautiful woman in my life so when I'm not, she reminds me. And she does it in love. But she will go, you probably don't need to post that. You probably don't need to say that. You probably need to apologize for saying that. You need, you know, and so God gave me a, 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 a lovely woman to help keep me straight when I'm not following Christ because she was like, your kids are watching you. Your friends are watching you. Your church is watching you. Your neighbors are watching you. You know, and, 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 and the flesh wants to go, well, they need to just figure it out. No, we have to set the example. So I will say, follow me as I follow Christ. If I turn the wrong direction and I'm not following Christ, don't follow me to the wall. Just let me hit it and make a splat and watch me and keep on going. But when I'm following Christ, follow me. And so we want the same going for us. So he says, listen, make sure that you've received this. God never intended the believer to just be a little wallflower and say, oh boy, look, look what I look what I look what Christ did for me. No, it's a purpose. He's given us a purpose of how we ought to walk and how we are to please God. You know, God wants us to please him. Now, what does the Bible say pleases God? faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hmm. So that means as I walk, I better walk with faith. And if I'm lacking in faith, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? The Word of God. And so as we get into the Word, the Word gets into us, and it activates faith, and now we begin to walk as we ought to walk, and we begin to please God because we're walking now in our faith. Because that's what He wants to see from us. God doesn't want... Sometimes we live this in our everyday lives, right? I mean, we're all human sometimes. You know, uh, things are good, I'm great. Things are bad, not so good. Things are good today, things are bad tomorrow. And we live the roller coaster life. 
And I used to love roller coasters when I was a kid, you know. And I still love roller coasters, but they don't love me anymore, you know. And so after about one or two of these, and, you know, it's not so pretty anymore. But, but, but roller coaster life in our spiritual walk is not what he's looking for. Here's what he's looking for. But we have to be increasing more and more in our faith, our hope, and our love. That's how we ought to walk. Paul's given us the encouragement. He says, he told them at Thessalonica, and he's telling us today at North Augusta, just as you have received from us. How have we received from us? We've been reading his epistles. So just as if we received from Paul, we ought to learn how to walk and please God and have the faith that he wants us to have as we begin to grow. The Bible, one of the things Paul talked about is growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Growth. When you look at a chart, and people you know, want to measure the growth of their company, they're looking for, they're not looking for the, you know, because that's not growth. That's decline. God's not looking for a decline. He's looking for growth. Abound more and more, you know. And it's like, you know, God's not looking for a roller coaster. He's looking for a spaceship. And that's what he wants to see from us. But our growth is our responsibility. He's done it all. We're not waiting on God. Some people say, you know, I I just want a new thing from God. You don't need anything new from Him. You've got everything you need, according to the Scriptures, to abound more and more. You've got it. We just have to do it. Nike stole that from the church. Just do it. We have to do it. But he's given us everything we need, the capability to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ and to be a witness and a testimony of his grace. The greatest way that we are able to be a witness and a testimony is knowing that we are walking how we ought to walk and we please God with our faith and hope and our love. Matter of fact, you won't even have to say to people, I'm a Christian. They will know it. Why? Because of our faith and our hope and our love. They'll know we are Christians by our love. So they're going to know that. When, when they see you go through a trial, by the way, we learned last week, we're going to have affliction. And so they're going to see you go through affliction, and all of a sudden, they're going to see in you a faith that they don't have. Because when they have stuff go wrong in their life, it, it just collapses them. But they're looking at you going, in the world, This guy loses his job and he's still praising Jesus. Everything seems to be falling in on him and he's still talking about the Lord. Uh, How? How? Because they have a faith. They have a hope. How do they just love people the way they love people over there at North Augusta? I mean, I walk in there and there's so many people I don't like. I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? Thank you, Jesus. God said. But there's sometimes we are able to love each other, and we, and, and we may not even understand, how can I love these people like I love them? That is incredible. That's what we have in Christ. There is no one that we're not capable of loving because love is a choice. Love is a choice. There's not anyone that, that you're not capable of loving. Now, it may, you may say it's hard, and it may be hard, but you're capable. You're capable. There's no one you can say, well, I can just tell you what, I don't love them. No, I can love them. I'm choosing not to love them. But if I'm going to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, I will choose to love. Because... The Scripture says, how can I love God who I cannot see if I can't love who I can see? That's a pretty big comparison that he put that to. That if I can love God, you know, everybody says, I love God, I love God. 
but I cannot stand or put up with or love that person, blah, 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 blah. They always got, they, they're always on my last nerve, and they don't know that. You know, sometimes God puts people to get on your last nerve to get you to grow. And if you'll learn to love them, maybe you can move on from that and find another thing you got to grow in. That's just a thought. I know how he works in me. Whew. He'll keep me going around that same block until I get it figured out. Once I get it figured out, then I get to go to another street and do it again. But hey, at least it ain't the same view. <laughs> right? It's a different view, and sometimes a different view helps, you know. So he, he says, listen, you need to make sure that you're walking how you ought to walk. Then he says in verse 2, for you know. Say, I know. Paul's always big about you should know, or don't you know. Because, see, we have to know. That's how you get free. No truth, and it makes you free. If you heard some truth, but you don't know the truth, then you're not going to be free. Knowing truth will get you to the place, as we said a while ago, is that you don't know just, this is what I believe. You'll know, know why you believe it, because you know truth. Truth will just absolutely change everything. And he says, for you know, and he says, here's what we've done. We, we, what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. We have looked at some of those through, through, through uh, Thessalonica, but we have been through Ephesians. We have been through other epistles and, and he, always wanting to people to know something. He's always trying to give them information, information. And then he encourages and he urges. He encourages, he urges because he wants to see growth. You know, I, I said this, and I've said this over and over. Listen, I want, to see every, I want to see every chair in this room filled. At times it gets close, and then, you know, stuff happens, weather happens, whatever. You know, and we'll get close, and then we'll back down, you know. But I want to see every, every chair in here filled. We got more that we can bring in here. Oh, we got plenty of room for more chairs. But above that, I would rather see spiritual growth in every single person that's a part of this ministry. Because you can be full and be empty. And that's not what we want to see. Not at New Life. We want to be full, both in number, but also in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be growing. 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 And growing. And so Paul was giving them everything they needed. Now remember, Paul speaks of himself. And it, it's not like he's... He's trying to say, worship me. He, does, he never says, worship me. He says, follow me. There's a difference. Because I, I, I hear this sometimes. Oh, they're just a pastor follower. Like that's a bad thing. Well, it's a bad thing if the person you're following is going right into the wall. Yeah, but it's okay to find people to follow. Matter of fact, the Scripture tells us two people to identify. Those who set examples to follow and those who avoid. Both those scriptures. If you find someone that always sows discord and causes trouble, you need to note them, mark them, and stay away from them. That's what scripture says. That's not me. That's scripture. Avoid them. But he also says, find those that are example setters and follow them. So when somebody says, hey, they're, they're, they're a pastor follower. So? So? Some of y'all... Wednesday nights with Todd Cook. He, he likes that. So, go back and listen to it. It's online, okay? It'll, you, you'll, it'll thrill you. It's good. I think he did part two Wednesday night and part one the couple weeks before. But either way, get back. Track. Back in. Okay, I'm back. So, as, 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 as this is going on in our lives and as we see these things happening, we need to know that, that we're not here to worship Paul, but we're here to follow Paul. People don't need to worship us. I don't want anybody to worship me as their pastor. That's stupid. But if I'm going the right direction, I do want you to follow me as I follow Christ. You want people to follow you as you follow Christ. So it's okay if someone, it doesn't offend me when I hear someone say that to me. Had someone say that to me last week. Had a pastor that, that I am acquainted with, um, that, that God is really doing some great things in his life right now. He had gone through some struggles a few years ago, but right now, I mean, God's just using him mightily. And, and people were commenting uh, on, his, on, his, on his page on, on Facebook. And there was this guy, 
I could see him. I bet he, I bet he looked just like a Pharisee. But he, 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 he was sitting there, and yeah, I could see him sitting behind his phone and, and just texting. Y'all bunch of people are a bunch of preacher followers. And I commented. And I said, yep, I'm guilty. I have followed his ministry for quite a while because there is no one that knows how to encourage the body of Christ like this pastor. And I said, so, yeah, I'm a preacher follower. So it's okay as long as they're following Christ, okay? So Paul didn't say, worship me. He said, follow me. He isn't, he isn't the one that died for them. He is, he's merely one of the Lord Jesus Christ's people he's used to do the work. Paul, has, Paul was commissioned by God. By the way, you are too. But he was commissioned, but he got his commission way back in Acts chapter 9. If you get a chance, go read Acts chapter 9. Because you get the calling and the mission that was commissioned to, to, to Paul in chapter 9. And, and his job, even though he was a, he was a big-time devout Jew, who loved his people. Matter of fact, when, when his conversion happened, his number one goal was to see his people come into the knowledge of Christ. But, but God said, I'm not sending you to your people. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jews. Now, I'm sure that probably had to sit well with Paul because as a devout Jew, that's not what you want to do. You're not really interested in the Gentiles. You don't want to be a part of that. But that's what he says. I've commissioned you to go to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish world, and you are to deliver them the message of grace. That's what his call was. To the point, and I don't think he necessarily decided he wasn't going to do it, but one of the things that got him to Rome was going to jail. Sometimes God will put us in a prison or allow us to be put in a prison so that we can get in our place. Because that didn't look like it. I mean, I'd start rebuking the devil. You know, if I got put in jail, I'm going to start rebuking the devil. But it was allowed by God to get him to Rome because he needed to get to the Gentiles. And where he was at was not where they were. And so Paul got sent there and commissioned there to share the gospel. And so here he, he tells these Thessalonians how that, in the, in the, remember, like I said, three or four weeks he was with them. He gave them all the things they needed to the point that even though he wasn't there very long, man, it was a thriving church there because they had grabbed a hold to it. Go over to uh, Galatians a minute. Now, I, I want to kind of just qualify a little bit when I say that the church needs to be studying the epistles of Paul and why, how important that is to me. And, and, and always get what I say because sometimes when I say stuff, people try to say what I didn't say or what they thought I said. So I have to sometimes qualify what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't read the Old Testament. I'm not saying don't read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to study Paul's epistles. Because we need to know what the church needs to be doing right now. Right now. Today. And you're going to find that in the doctrines that Paul's writing to the church. And so, I, I, I've got people that I, uh, they're not friends. They're people that I have met that literally will tell me, and have been told, I don't even think Paul's writing should be a part of the Bible. I'm like, what? You ain't even worth a comment, man. You're an idiot. I mean, that's just, that's far beyond even stupid. So I just leave that alone. But that's, that's what this person told me. I don't think Paul's, Paul was an egotistical, uh, what do they call him? An egotistical, uh, male chauvinist. And I'm like, dude, do you realize what Paul did for women? Before Paul, do you know women didn't count in society? Good example is when the when he fed the five thousand. That was men. There was probably about ten to fifteen thousand because there were women and children there. But in society at that time, it was just about the man. Paul comes in and says, 
There is neither male nor female. There is neither bond nor free. When you come to Christ, we come on level ground. Male chauvinist? What are you talking about? But that was his, that was his view on it. And I didn't even argue with him because the Bible talks about uh, avoiding foolish debates. And it wasn't even worth my breath to even do that. I just, they make these beautiful buttons on Facebook. It's called unfriend. Most setting free button there is. And then they have another one up under that. Block. Boom. It is, whoo, blessed. It's freedom, man, freedom. And so, and so you know, here he is. In, in fact, a lot of the times these Judaizers would accuse Paul. Uh, they, they called him an imposter. They were always trying to go about trying to destroy what he, what he was trying to do. But, but he, just as people even still do it today, it's amazing the people that don't want you to get into Paul's epistles. Why? Because the devil knows if the church ever gets in there and studies these things, it's going to set us free in a way that we have never had before. So get in there and read those. But Paul qualifies it now here in Galatians chapter 1. And I want you to turn there in Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 11. And he says this, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. He says, for I never received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, when, when you read that, you go, I don't remember Paul and Jesus hanging out in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I, I don't remember that. When, when did they get together? When did they have coffee? I don't, I don't remember them talking. Because remember, at that time, Saul, who was Paul, same guy. So why, why does his name change? He gave him a Gentile name. He's getting sent to the Gentiles. You can't call him Saul no more. That was, a, that was a Hebrew name. He gave him a Gentile name, Paul. So that's, there you go, information. Why he's now Paul. But Saul, at that time, Saul or Paul now, he, 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 wasn't, con, he wasn't with Christ. Matter of fact, he was going around persecuting those who were following this guy. He was destroying the church. Now, you want to talk about grace. Because I would have, you know, Paul would have been my last resort. I would have took him off that donkey, but it would have been a lot different than the way he got taken off and what happened to him after that. But I, God saw him grace, and, and I'm sure he had this in his mind. If I can get the zeal out of this guy Saul that he has of persecuting me, what could happen if this guy got converted? And I had that same zeal now working for me instead of against me. And we, were, we got to acknowledge it. We got to see it. We get to read it. And so, how in the world this happened? He's, you know, he, he, did, he makes it clear. He didn't learn from man. You know, you would have think, here, here's the way it would have worked in my thinking. Okay, Saul gets saved. Gets his life changed. And then Jesus says, and here's what I need you to do. I need you to go to Jerusalem. I need, to get you, I need to get you with Peter. And I need to get you with John. And, and, and they've got some things that they're going to put in you that's going to help you go forward. Nope. He did not do that. Not at all. He didn't do any of that. Now, 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 now Paul knew the Old Testament. I mean, matter of fact, he was a scribe among scribes, Pharisee among Pharisees. He knew it all when it came to the law. But this was a whole new thing. Because this was new covenant. This is the gospel of grace. Paul is, is going to hear about it, but Peter and John had not even experienced this yet. Oh, th that comes. You keep reading in Acts, and you'll find Peter and Paul having some lovely conversations. As a matter of fact, Paul calls him on the carpet a couple of times. And even, even Peter gets to the point in, in, in reading First and Second Peter, he says, there's some things that Paul says I, I don't get, but I know he's heard from God. And so 
you know, because a Jew just, you know, they have a hard time. You start bringing in Gentiles and wanting to let them come in and be a part. And so it was hard for him. But he says, no. He says, he said, I didn't, I, he didn't send me to Jerusalem. He didn't send me to them. He, I didn't get it from any man, but he taught me himself. He took me to where I needed to go. And matter of fact, he, he, he took him to the place that, that, that literally the same place that Moses went and got the uh, Ten Commandments. That's where he sent Paul in Arabia and downloaded him for three and a half years. You can read about it in Acts. And downloaded him right there. That's why Paul can be called an apostle because one, one of the things of an apostle, they had to be an eyewitness of Christ. You say, well, wait a minute. He wasn't, yeah, but he did. He had revel- He was brought in. Because Paul even said, I don't know if I was in a dream. I don't know if I got taken up to the third head. I don't know. But here's what I do know. Here's what he told me. And he got downloaded for three and a half years. By the way, same amount of time that he spent with the disciples. To get them to what they were supposed to do. He spends that same amount of time with the Lord before he ever even goes out to the Gentile nation. He says in verse 13 in uh, in Galatians 1, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries and my, my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through His grace to reveal His Son in me. What a download. What a download. Paul's teaching is how we have to, this is how we get this further revelation that Christ, because Christ gave all kinds of revelation there at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But that wasn't, that wasn't the end of Jesus giving the message. He gave Paul instructions of how the Gentiles were to conduct themselves and how they were ought to please God. And that's why we have to read these epistles and get them, get them in, our, in our lives and begin to understand them and know who we are. So he says, I, I, here's what I learned. To reveal His Son in me that I might preach among the Gentiles. He says in verse 17, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem, to those who were the apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And that was a three and a half year period, by the way, from Arabia back to Damascus. And so he never sent him to those guys because he had something special for him because he was starting a new entity called the church. You and I. And the church is made up of not just Jew, not just Gentile, but of all kind, female, male, Jew, Gentile, all of it. When we, by grace, receive the gospel, we become part of that. So, back there in First Thessalonians, he says, back in verse 1 of, of chapter 4, so just as you received from us how we ought to walk, how we ought to live, you know, I, you, have you ever heard the statement, we got to walk the walk and talk the talk? You know, it's great to walk the walk and talk the talk. You can't just do the talking without the walking. You can't just do the walking without the talking. So we have to walk the walk and talk the talk. But this is what Paul is talking about. As a believer, we're to walk the walk and to please God so that the world may abound and grow in grace and the knowledge more and more. I am a conduit. You are a conduit. We don't, we, we're not the power, but we carry the power. And power is only good when it's being used. If we cut off all the lights in here, it's pitch black dark, and we go, man, I can't believe it's so dark in here. What are we going to do? You turn on the light. You know, we don't have to wait for someone to invent electricity. We don't have to wait for someone to... All we have to do is turn on what has been given to us. The very moment you got saved, you know the Scriptures, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in 
you. You can say it this way. The same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me. Sometimes we need to say me because that makes it more, you know, when you say you, but when you say me, me, that, that same power, Christ raised up from the dead, dead three days, and he is raised. And matter of fact, the raising that happened to him was more than just being raised from the dead because Lazarus was raised from the dead. But guess what? Lazarus died again. He's, he's in a grave somewhere. The resurrection that happened to Jesus to never die again. That same power lives on the inside of you and I. But we have to learn how to grow in the grace and the knowledge so that we can abound more and more in that power and we have to turn the switch on. Be the conductor. Be the conductor. And so now, you know, we... we when, when we see Paul's life and, and we see, you know, how he wanted to see people matured and, you know, we, 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 how we work with our kids, we want, we, don't, we want our kids to mature, you know, and, and we watch them, you know, and, and, and maybe a child is four or five years old and, 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 and we want to see them begin to mature and we, we be able to look back and go, man, it's so good to see it happen. Now, I know sometimes it takes longer than others, you know, to, to see that happen, you know, and maybe you're still waiting on that kid that was born in 1960 to get there but hang in with them just hang in with them hang in with them but can you imagine if this child was 35 but they still acted five what would we do well we would have probably long before gone somewhere and gotten some professional help because something's not this is not normal i mean this something ain't right here i mean at 35 i mean that that no, they should be walking and talking and feeding themselves. And so if that's not happening, something's not normal. Y'all heard me say this before, but how many times in the church we got people that have been saved 20 and 30 years, and they're still going, me, feed me, feed me, change me, change me, and they still act like they're three years old, and we just take that as normal. That ain't normal. We are required to grow. Everything that's, that's been put in us is for us to be able to grow. It's all been given to us. And so it's heartbreaking when we see a, a, a physical child that's not growing like they should be. But it's heartbreaking that when we see believers that are still have the same hang-ups as they had 10 15 years ago. It's like, we got, we got to get something together here. You know, we got, we got to work on this because this isn't normal. And so Paul made it a point to grow, to grow, to grow, to grow, to grow. And I believe that he's calling out for the church today to grow, to grow, to grow, to grow, even above the numbers that we have, to grow to grow in our spiritual walk, to grow in pleasing God, to grow in our faith, to grow in our hope, and to grow in our love, right? That's what we need to be doing. That's what, we need, that's what He's looking for for us. As we close, I'm going to get ready to, to, to read this real quick, and then we're going we're gonna to be done. He says in verse 3, and I don't even think I gave them this verse, but I'm going to read it. He says, for this is the will of God. People always want to, I want to know what God's will is. I'm fixing to tell you. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. Oh, that's a big old word. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. See, a lot of times people get with grace, they want to start excusing sin. Paul, Paul's making it very clear, God never excuses sin because of grace. He says, this is the will of God. This is the will of God for your life today. To walk in your sanctification. What does that mean? That's a big old word. Sanctified means you have been set apart. Walk in that. He has set you apart for a divine purpose. God has given you a divine purpose. I don't care who you are in this room. I don't care if you got saved last week, you got saved this morning, or you've been saved 30 years. You have been given in you a purpose. You have been set apart. 
Bible tells us that we're not our own. We have been bought with a price. And so you now belong to Him. You have been set apart for His purpose. And part of His purpose of that sanctification is for us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, He even said it in Thessalonians. It was a commandment. Ooh, we talking about the commandments. That's a commandment. That means if you think about it and you think you might want to try growing, try it. Uh, if you'd like to grow, we'd want you to grow. No. God says, grow. I have, done, I have done everything for you to be able to grow. Now grow. Grow. And so that's my word for you today. Grow. Just grow. As you go, grow. As you go, grow. And if you want to learn how to grow, the church must get into Paul's epistles and get those things not just in my head, but get them in my spirit. Let's stand together. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Above anything else we've said today, the greatest need that you have in your life is being a believer. And Paul gave us the scriptures in Romans because that's what he was all about was the gospel. The gospel, he says, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the good news. And here's what the good news is, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. That is the good news. Because when he died, he died my death. When he was buried, he was dead. Wasn't in a coma. <laughs> he wasn't just sleeping. He was dead. And then three days later, the power of God through the Holy Spirit raised him. You and I could not be taken from darkness and lostness and sin and made a new creature in Christ had the death, the burial, and the resurrection not happened. So I hope this morning that there's not a person in this room that has never done that but if you haven't I got good news for you he made it so easy he said this in Romans that if you'll believe with your heart your heart is your inner being the Lord Jesus and that if you would confess him as your Lord and your Savior he says you will be saved wow that was easy that's how easy it is he made it easy because if it wasn't easy, I'd still be lost. And so he made it so easy that even I could do it. He made it so easy even a caveman could do it. Somebody might remember the commercials years ago. He made it so easy even I could understand that. That he died for me, he rose again for me, and all I have to do is believe that, and then I confess to him that you are my Lord and you're my Savior. And just that very moment, you go from darkness to light. Just that very moment, the power of God comes on the inside of you. And so if you haven't done that today, I encourage you to place your faith and trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confess him as your Lord. Believe that he did it for you, and you can be saved today. If you're a believer here this morning, and maybe you, maybe you hadn't been growing. Maybe you've been stunning your growth. I want to encourage you today. You have everything in you to grow. Get into His Word and begin to feed on the Word. And I promise you, you will see yourself change. You, you, you may not go to here tomorrow, but you will go here. You, you, you may not be what you want to be, but you won't be where you were yesterday because you're being changed from glory to to glory. And that's what He wants to see in His church. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank You and we praise You today. Lord, I thank You for the power of Your Word. Father, I thank You, Lord, that You've given us everything that we need through Your Word. And Father, I thank You that Your Word tells us that when You send Your Word out, it does not return void. But as it is sent forward, it will accomplish what it has been sent forth to do. And so, Father, we speak that over this word today, that it will accomplish what it has been sent forth to do today. And that lives will be radically changed. They'll become even more of a, of a strong desire to get into the word and allow that word to get into us. That we can honestly begin to look at our lives and see the growth that takes place. 
in our individual lives every day as we go forward and go higher and abound more and more in the grace and the knowledge of of who you are, God. Father, we give you the praise for that. And Father, this is not something we have to work up. You've already given us everything. It's there. We just have to do it. And God, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray as we leave this building, God, that as the church leaves and we go out, that we'll continue to represent you where we go. Father, that you'll keep us safe on the roads and, 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 and with the wet roads and everything, that you'll get us to where we need to go today, safe and sound, and we give you all the glory and the honor and praise for that in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen.